let's get cracking. Um, this week, uh, the Zoom session, and oh, I'll just get my, my thing working here. It's got a problem. Oh, no, it's not. It's just moving too quickly. All right, so I've just hit the record button. We're going to get talking about that, the chemical sciences. Now, on the, the Moodle site this week, I've actually put up, um, you know, the Flipbit um, 6, and it's very heavily uh, guided by Loxley. And the reason I've done that is because Loxley actually does the science of the chemical and physical sciences really well from an early childhood and, and primary school um, perspective. So um, we're going to follow Loxley through this, this chain for the next couple of weeks and do have a look at your flipped bit. Um, it's really important because there we're, we're covering the science knowledge, really the content knowledge. And on that note, um, I'm at the stage of the course where I'm putting up two lectures each week. Um, one is a content lecture. And this week, you, some of you may have seen it already. Um, has anyone been online and looked at it? Right, no one's volunteering. Okay, and the second one I'll put up is the Zoom. Now, the reason being, um, some people have a background in science. So you don't really need to look at the content lecture. But what I do in the content lecture is I actually put up a lot of resources. And I'll talk a little bit about them as we go through. So let's have a look at this week. Um, so that, that's up there. I normally put that up there on Monday, or I think I put it up Tuesday this morning. But by and large, um, the, the content lecture is there to give you some background. It supports the flipped bit. And then the Zoom session is where I'm going to talk primarily about assessment tasks and, and items related to assessment. So our key terms, now they're all there for you. And really, uh, what Loxley talks about this week is having a narrative. If you've got a narrative for teaching science, and, and you know, and we go back here to our indigenous perspectives, they have a narrative for creation, they have a narrative for everything, for relations, for, for why we do what we do, for how we keep safe, how we don't swim in rivers with crocodiles. I mean, there's a narrative underpinning all of that. And if it worked for so many thousands of years for such a rich and diverse culture and such a magnificent culture, then it can work for us as science teachers. Okay, a couple of people saying they don't have audio or video. Um, Jody, no audio or video? Jackie? All right, Look, everything's ticking on this end, seems to be working. I'll keep going. Um, we're talking here about the narrative. So if you can talk about matter, if you know what matter is, if you know that matter has various states, and, and Maxine, this is right up your alley because this is what your, um, your lesson sequence was all about, and I've really just enjoyed reading that. Elements. We've got 118 core elements. We have a periodic table. Now, most of us aren't going to need to know the periodic table because it doesn't relate to primary school teaching. But if you find yourself suddenly in year 7, 8 or 9 class, um, which you could do as a primary teacher, you may have some, some need to know what a periodic table is and what it stands for. Compounds, two or more elements chemically combined. Mixtures, two or more substances, but not chemically combined. A chemical reaction is a rearrangement of atoms. If we've got a narrative around these seven terms, we can teach science. Now, for those of you who don't, who doubt that, file this, this link, this hyperlink here, file this URL into your memory and your database. If you want, you know, get it tattooed if you want, and do something what a lot of people do these days. Look at your primary connections. This is your background science resources. Now, in the content lecture this week, I take you through it and show you some of the aspects of it, but it's just brilliant. Before you teach any aspect of primary science, can I just ask someone to mute themselves there who's just come on recently? We're getting your phone calls. Okay, we never know who it is, so it's got to be confidential. So primary connections, science background resources, use that hyperlink and it will take you to a magnificent resource where you can bone up on your science before you teach it. It tells you everything. It gives you the elaborations. It connects it all to the curriculum. And it really is really very, very, very useful. So don't worry about not knowing the science. Primary connections assume you don't. They've given you these wonderful resources and I've put it in the content lecture for this week and do encourage you to please go and have a look at them. Use them for the future. I'm also talking about other resources this week too and some great examples. Now, we're in a really unusual position. We're, we're teaching science over the internet. Now, let's, let's face it, you know, where's our wet space? Where's our lab? Where's the Bunsen burner? Where's our crucible? You know, all of these different things are missing. 
uh, in case you hadn't noticed. So what we're doing is, is, is a lot of science, but we, we're using alternate pathways to science. We're talking here about creation and creativity, um, you know, a creative enterprise of doing science and science inquiry. So we're looking at, you know, we've talked a lot about poetry, we've talked about role play, we've talked about video, drawing, art. We're incorporating a broad range of curriculum perspectives into science because if students know that all learning spills from that creative source, all learning spills from that epicenter, then science will make as much sense to them as, for instance, art, as will language, as will language other than English, as, as anything they do. So some of the resources I've put up here are ones that you can replicate really easily. Now, we don't have a lab. Uh, I'm not going to put on a wet white coat and, and stand in front of a Bunsen burner and talk to it. You know, these are all things that we're going to have to try on our own and we're going to have to try and master. But we don't need the Bunsen burners. We've got things like biscuit bashing. And, you know, we can use a rolling pin. We can crush biscuits, and we can analyse the content. What happens to biscuits, the properties that make them up, how we can break them down, how we can reconstitute them. We can do it with heavy sugars, soft drinks. All we need is a couple of different soft drinks, and we can do really, really great science investigations. We can look at irreversible reactions, gases to solid. We can collect carbon soot from a candle. And it sounds, sounds very unexciting, but actually it's very exciting when you watch the primary students do it. Anything with heat is always an issue with young kids. But, you know, these videos are here for you to, you know, to give you confidence. Most of you are going to teach, about 70% of you are going to teach in schools with no wet labs, no science labs. So the science you do is going to be a little bit like the science we're doing. You know, you're going to be walking that tribal route to science. You know, what is it in our lives that are scientific? How do we develop the understandings? How do we bring in, you know, the, this, this complex world of science, the language, the literacy, and, and use it to explain our everyday? Um, a really nice one, the last one down here is forget about boring old sugar. Um, polystyrene cups, you know, when you drop them in, in um, a nail polish remover, they do amazing things. They melt and they bubble and they, you know, they buckle. It's really exciting stuff. So forget about sugar in water. You know, try dissolving polystyrene cups to demonstrate a different time, type of dissolving to primary students. And, and of course, you know, um, work from there on, on your understandings. So there's a whole range of things we can do. We don't need a lab. We're not hamstrung. The only limit on us is our imaginations. So I'm not going to talk too much about this stuff. This is all in the content lecture. I'm just going to talk about Loxley. Okay, he talks about science from the everyday you or Loxley et al. There are many of them. And we never know who's writing at any one given time because they don't identify. But it's a really good grounded resource. And I notice in assessment task number one, many of you using, you know, the, the exploration or the explanation stage, the redescribing and then the application, you're actually picking up Loxley's model. And, and that says to me, intuitively, it's working. You know, this everyday use of science is something we, we, can, we can adapt. Um, it talks about the common experience and properties of matter. Um, then goes on to look at solids, liquids, and gases. So you can see the hierarchy of knowledge here, the narrative that, that essentially to teach it, we have to be able to, to talk it. So we know that solids, liquids, gases are, are different um, are properties, diff different substances. The particle matter uh, model of matter gives us a narrative to explain how all this happens. What happens when we add heat? We release energy. What does that do? Well, it can do a range of things. Okay? It can change a substance or it can create a chemical reaction. Reversible and physical changes. Some changes are reversible and some are non-reversible. We can look at atoms, elements, compounds, mixtures, and we know that you know, science has yet to agree on what an atom looks like. You know, we've got Heisenberg's theories, we've got complementarity. We, we now know that atoms don't move around in circles. They actually vibrate, they shake, they move in waves. You know, that science is slowly beginning, and Einstein was right. You know, time, space, warps and bends. Atoms do the same. You know, we are no closer really to understanding what they do than we were 50 to 60 years ago and how they look. But we have a narrative for talking about them. That's all we need, a narrative. And of course, we come to chemical change and chemical reactions. You know, if you like the cream and cherry on, on top of this uh, chemicals unit. If we can wheel those things together, we can teach science. Now, just quickly think to yourself and analyse, where am I strong? Where am I weak? What might I need to bone up on? So resources for teachers, I've put up on, on the content lecture this week, really good for teachers or for flipping your class. There's a really good uh, resource there, the one I mentioned about the, the background resources. When you're teaching a unit of science, go into this link, look it up, and you've got all the resources you need. I've put something up there from the Smithsonian Institute, 
And it's really, really good. It's a chemistry timeline, which takes you basically through the world of chemistry, who was what. And this is really, really good for the human endeavor stream. If you've got a group of students, you know, get them to identify a significant moment in science or three significant moments in chemistry and, and then get them to research and present why they're significant. You know, you've got your, your resources here for you. The Royal Society of Chemists, are no, they're no dullards. They're, you know, they're not dumb, they're bright. And what's more, they, they've created a periodic table which is totally interactive. Um, and you can fool around with this table and you can actually learn a lot about it. We can look at you know, the chemical blocks, why they're blocks. We can look at the periods. We can analyse all of these different aspects of the periodic table um, and even down to the molecular structure of particular elements themselves. It's really good. It's interactive. And for kids really age year seven to nine, it's a really good inroad um, to, to the periodic table and to the concept of atomic structure. Um, Royal Society of Chemists also do something on steam. Now, they've got a great page there on chemistry and art, and they look at, you know, how to mix paints. Um, and they do all this integration, pottery and chemistry. Um, and they have another page, too, on the health sciences. So if you are going to cruise these resources and you're looking for things to do, have a good look. The Royal Society of Chemists, they may sound like a bunch of nerds and squares, but really they do great stuff on chemistry and art, and they have something fabulous on health sciences as well, um, which is terrific. What I am going to talk about in this lecture, um, I talked about all that stuff in the content lecture. Um, I'm going to talk about assessment task number two. And you're thinking, wait a minute, assessment task number one, the body hasn't gone cold yet. We haven't got our marks back. Well, I understand that. And I'm a little bit hamstrung. Again, I repeat, I've still got 16 assignments outstanding. Um, and that's greater than 10%. We've only got 134 uh, people in the course. So it's greater than 10% um, of the, the population. I can't release marks until I get below that 10%. So what I can do is, is get you excited about it, assessment task number two. Now, let's have a close look at it. Um, it's about assessing two units of work. And what are we assessing it for? Well, we're looking at the assessment aspects of it. You may remember just before the break, the last unit we did was on assessment in science, in chemical and physical sciences. This assessment task now builds on that. You're going to look at two units of science. You're going to evaluate the assessment in there and ultimately make recommendations on how to approve them. But there's a couple of things we need to know about before we get too far into that. And feel free to jump in any time and ask questions. I like people who jump in. It's a level of activity. So here is the task. And I know that's a full screen. I thought about putting it on two, but then I thought, no, we'll put it on one because I really need to talk to it in some degree of, of um, level. So the first thing I want to point to here is two consecutive units of science work. That's what the task says. Two consecutive units of science. Who online can define or describe what two consecutive units are? Who'd like to have a go? Why? What makes a unit consecutive? Hey, Colin, it's Kelly. Kelly, fire away. What, what do you think makes a unit consecutive? Oh, I'm, I'm taking a wild stab in the dark here, but I'm just going to say that maybe one leads is a prerequisite to another or one leads into another unit of work. Um, some sort of prior knowledge is, is a, attained in the first unit to go on to the second unit, maybe. Excellent. Look, you're spot on. And, and these are decisions the teacher makes. So when you talk about consecutive, you just got to say why they're consecutive. So you may be doing a unit on physical science um, and then a second unit on chemical science. But you may be using, for instance, the inquiry skills you developed in the first unit to justify your second unit. You could be using the human endeavour aspects of the first unit to justify your second unit. Or you could do what teachers generally do with science and look at the understandings and say, okay, I was looking at water in this unit, so I'm going to look at water in my chemistry unit. That's my reason why they're consecutive. So some people get hung up on this. Don't get hung up on it, get clear on it. Kelly's absolutely right. You're in the driver's seat. You determine what consecutive means. Why are they consecutive? Give us a description of what makes them consecutive and you've ticked that criteria, that's fine. Okay, it could be age level, it could be uh, inquiry skills, it could be the content, 
Um, it could be the human endeavor aspect. It could be the ethical issues or the accidental sciences. You may, for instance, be looking at, at energy. And from that, you may come across a unit on chemical energy and nuclear energy. And you may look at the spin-offs from the atomic bomb and the impact on Hiroshima as part of human endeavor and ethics. You've got a lot of scope here to take control of this. Don't, don't get frightened by it. Any questions, please shoot them through or put them on the forum. Talk to us, uh, other students about them and you'll get some very grounded responses, I'm sure. Once you've got your consecutive units, okay, you're going to identify current research practice in assessment and science. Now, we go back to week five for that. Um, you know, Black and Willem, uh, we're going to drag out some of these classics, some of Dennis Goodrum's stuff, um, where we talk about assessment in science. And we know the ACS is all geared around inquiry-based processes and the assessment needs to be connected to the learning that the students are doing. So all of these are really core aspects. Um, and, and we know the assessment follows three stages, diagnostic, formative and, assess and summative. Now, we've dealt with diagnostic largely in assessment task number one. Assessment task number two is going to get you to focus on formative and summative. Okay, it really, that's, that's where the, the fruit for, for picking lies in this particular assessment. Now, you can use a table if you want to, to identify the assessment in, in your two units. Okay, you identify the formative steps and you can identify the summative items. And in doing so, make a statement about whether it's assessment for, of, or as learning. Okay, so stages we go through, the little steps you're going to have to address. And you're also going to have to identify how these assessment items demonstrate student learning or motivate and engage students in learning. And if they don't do that fully, then you're given the opportunity to make at least two recommendations to how you could improve them. Now, this may sound a little bit complex at this stage, but don't worry, as we go through this, this final five weeks of the program, we're going to be addressing this week in, week out. We're going to be addressing it constantly. So we'll start this week. I've put up a formative task on, on, on the discussion board. Some of you will do it. Most of you won't. But the aim is if you keep pace with me as I'm working through these forums and doing these tasks, come week 11 when this is due, you'll have it done. There'll be no last minute rush. It will just be a, a, a fine tune and a polish. So that's the model we're going to use for the second half of the term. So there's no big rush at the end. We'll be doing it consecutively as we go. So you're going to use, modify this assessment based on your recommendations, okay, based on current practice, good research. You should include how you're going to redesign the assessment task. You should put in the tool, the new tool you're going to use, and the techniques for promoting engagement and making reliable and consistent judgments based on student learning. Okay, and, and it's obviously got to have, you know, student judgments for learning for reporting purpose. So that's where we're going. Two units, looking at the assessment, formative, summative. You've got to make two recommendations from each unit. So one must be formative, one could be summative. In the second unit, one formative, one summative. You've got your four recommendations. It's based on current research. You've developed the tasks and shown how they're going to look. You've completed assessment task number two. So some of the criteria, the things you must do. You must have sophisticated explanation of the formative and some of the assessment used in each of your two units. So you've got to identify where the assessment is and what its purpose is, where it falls in the unit. Okay? You're going to make explicit identification of the types of assessment, so it'll be formative or summative. Is it going to be written? Is it collaborative? What are the aspects of it? Okay? We're also going to look at a comprehensive explanation of how they're used, how assessment's used. So you're going to map the assessment. Could I just ask someone to mute their mic if they could, please? Whatever it is, it sounds delicious. But if you could just mute your mic, it'd be great. And there are two appropriate recommendations. That's what we're looking for. When you've looked at, you know, for instance, physical science, year two, you've identified a unit, for instance, that may be on energy or electricity. Um, you've looked at the assessment. You've mapped it. You've shown where it occurs. You've identified two assessment tasks. And you've said, these could be improved. How? And you're doing that for each of your units. So my point here is it's not a scary assessment task. It actually builds very much on what we've been doing so far. There's nothing new in it. The focus is on assessment, formative and summative, and you're picking two units that you decide are linked for whatever reason are linked. We're using the 5E's model again if we use the primary connections unit. So you're able to map, you've got the, the units there, you can map the assessment, you see where it is, 
you can understand why it's being done, and then you make a judgment about how and when it can be improved and in what way. Now, the improvement may only be small. Okay, it may be the development of a rubric. It could be something really small. You may decide to turn it you know, into peer assessment and add a new dimension to the task. You may come up with something for reporting. There's a range of things you may elect to do. More on that later. So when we look at the challenges facing teachers, um, and, and again, I've thrown this in this week because um, it's a challenge for us learning how to teach science online. I mean, you know, we don't have a lab. We don't have a sand pit to play in. But, you know, there's... As a primary teacher, this is not unusual. So in, in what I'm saying, this is a nice resilience building way to learn science. Because what you're doing is, you know, we're getting kids to role play. You know, for instance, we talked two weeks ago about role playing, what happens when you add dye to a, a mixture. Uh, and you see, you know, what happens at a molecular level, getting the kids to blend and mix and using coloured bits of paper and passing it to each other and seeing how it disperses. All of these things can be done using drama. They can be done using role play. And what's more, they can also bring um, a really live dimension to the discussions that you're, you're trying to create in, in your inquiry-based classroom. But basically, there's, there's a low priority for science in the primary curriculum. And, I, and we all know this now with NAPLAN and, and other you know, compulsory tests and, and, other, and other things and you know, the assessment that goes on, all the justifications. Um, we're doing more and more um, administration and less and less teaching. Um, and so science is one of the, the areas that's suffering because let's face it, it's one of the harder ones to do. People don't, you know, a lot, of, a lot of teachers don't have a natural love of science. You may challenge that, which is great because we do need to challenge it. But many teachers don't. Many teachers will only teach the science they know. And, and the net result now is that we've got an overcrowded curriculum, so we're falling more back on habits. It's what humans do. You know, and someone's sitting down and, and for a romantic dinner and you turn on the telly and Netflix is on and this movie you both do, and then all of a sudden your partner starts picking their toes. That's what people do. We fall back to the lowest common denominator, to what we know. It's human behaviour. And in teachers, that's an overcrowding of the curriculum. Okay? So, and, and we've also got un, unachievable syllabus requirements in science. And, and here we talk about physical resources. You know, it's linked to inadequate resourcing. Um, so we've got, you know, limited access to in-service professional development. It's great if you're in Brisbane, but if you're not in Brisbane, and even then, it can take you two hours to get from one side of the city to the other to, to your professional development. But you know, up here, the Australian Science uh, Association, they don't do an awful lot, and it's a resource-based issue. So science teachers are pretty much left to their own opportunities, and, and as a result, you know, science teaching can seem like a hard thing to do. And there's also limited time for science education in, in pre-service teacher courses. I mean, we get, you know, two units to cover four really rich curriculum strands. That's unrealistic. What we're doing is we're looking at how to develop the skills to locate science, create a narrative around the core components, and then teach aspects of that narrative when and how we can. And, of course, there's a limited understanding by decision makers of the issues in teaching uh, of primary science. And, you know, this is being complicated, in my mind, by STEM. Now, STEM, you know, is, is a response. It's, it's a, a postmodern response to the failure of traditional curriculum. So what do we do? We jazz it up. We, you know, we disrupt traditional curriculum by calling it something sexy. All that does is devalue the existing challenge of trying to teach effective science. Okay? It may bring more kids into a technology-based uh, curriculum, but it's not going to bring them into deeper science understandings. You know, and we have to be careful about what we pass for solutions in science teaching. It's a problematic area. You know, we've got to get back to the basics. And, of course, um, the school context, teachers, principals and decision makers, um, you know, see science as something that they can add um, to a basis of a good education, something that they can promote to their education publics, to, you know, to, to people who are interested in their school and they can market as part of their school. And, of course, as a result, teachers are very change-weary. I mean, the Australian curriculum came in in 2012. Those of you who are aware of, of the current changes in senior schooling um, know that they're going to be implemented in, in 2018. So, you know, every six years, teachers are getting a major rogering from the politicians about how to update their practices and, you know, change everything so that in 10 years' time, we can all go back to what it was 30 years ago. So teachers are a little bit change-weary as well and a little bit cynical. I'm going to talk about the Australian um, curriculum and primary connections because that is, um, that's where this assignment task is, is assessment task sits. So we know that it's a combination when we look at primary connections, professional learning and curriculum units. So there's an approach 
And that approach is the five E's essentially, and it's inquiry based, right? And the curriculum units cover all aspects, you know, from foundation right through to year 10. Okay, we know that. We know that the core components are collaborative learning, the five E's, literacy, investigations, and ultimately the thing that we're pulling it all together with in this assessment task, our assessments. Okay, that's what we're looking at with primary connections. That's why that you'll see there's a link online in the subject Moodle, and I've put up about six or seven or eight primary connections units in the physical and chemical sciences there for you to look at. You can limit yourself to those or you can go beyond them, it doesn't matter. I do encourage you to work together, form groups. You may, for instance, form a group where both of you pick the same units. Both of you discuss the collab, you know, the, 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 the consecutive nature of them. And then you both discuss, chat to each other. This is what people do, what teachers do. Chat to each other about good professional practices in each of those units and how they can address this particular assessment task. This is not a competition, okay? You're not competing against other people when you get into your teaching, into your study. We're looking at best practice. So when we look at, at primary connections, we're talking about scientific literacy, about building that narrative. And, you know, Dennis Goodrum here is cited, you know, Hackling Rennie, uh, his little cohort here of researchers. Good paper. I'm throwing in some, some resources here for you so you can start collating them now. You're not having to worry about finding them all in week 10 when this is due in week 11. Start looking at some of these now. Okay. Uh, I think it was 2001 it was, the article. Yeah. So it's a high priority. And that's essentially what the ACS is all about. You know, it's about getting people to be Piaget, 1962, scientists in their own world. Engage in the discourses of and about science. Be literate. Be conversant. Be sceptical. You know, look at this. Be sceptical. Don't trust grown-ups. Now, I'm not talking about stranger danger here or, or help, help, stop the bad man. I'm talking about being sceptical about claims. Teaching healthy scepticism. And be able to, as a result of that, identify the questions that need to be asked, the way to investigate problems and what constitutes evidence what counts as evidence and all of this is connected obviously to their own wealth health and well-being it's not connected to knowledge it's not connected to hypotheses it's not connected to heisenberg it's connected to the learner to their own health and well-being what can science do for me in my life to improve my life collaborative learning Primary Connections has aspects of collaborative learning. Now, when we look at collaborative learning, informative assessment, the early years, usually K to two or F to two, it's often it's pairs, pair-based stuff. So look at this closely when you're looking at your Primary Connections unit. It's pair-based. And the roles normally assigned to the pairs are a speaker and a manager. So it's really important. You know, those very, very fundamental socialization skills. At years three to six, this tends to change. We generally see in the collaborative models, teams of three. Director, manager, speaker. So here we're trying to, you know, this whole process of triangulation. We are trying to develop language. We're trying to develop conceptual challenges. We're trying to develop different perspectives. So we move from two, one-on-one, -on -one, to three, where we've got interlocutory discussion, where people are throwing in their own pennies worth. And we can assign these, you know, these, these roles to students. We can describe them. What is the director? What do they do? Who is the manager? What do they do? What do you do when you're a speaker? Okay, now rotate. Wait a minute. We want all of the speakers in the rooms from all of the groups to go to the back corner. You're going to have a meeting and discuss where each of your teams are up to. Some jigsawing. Think about these different strategies, how collaborative learning does it in primary connections. And again, this may be you know, one of the suggestions when you've got to make some suggestions to assessment. This is formative assessment. Okay, collaborative learning you may make a, a recommendation on how a primary connections unit could be improved by you know, dabbling with the collaborative learning in there. The five E's, nothing new to you. What is the five E's? We know it's an inquiry model and it's an inquiry model for teaching and learning and it's designed to, to facilitate conceptual change. Now I marked, you know, again, 70 odd papers um, from assessment task number one and look, Less than half talked about the five E's as a conceptual change model. That's what it is. It's not a barn dance. It's not four-step rock and roll. It's not swing dancing. It's a conceptual change model. So when we teach the five E's, what concepts are we changing? What misconcepts 
are we dealing with in, in the first stage? In the second stage, you know, when we explore what are we dealing with, what conceptual changes are we looking at there? In the third stage, explain, elaborate through for, you know, to evaluate what conceptual changes are we trying to trigger? It's not a case of do this at this stage, do that at this stage. What are the concepts? And that was the purpose of assessment task number one. Okay, what concepts were you trying to change that led from deconstruction, you know, through to reconstruction, ultimately to co-construction, where we have the learner developing new scientific applications. In primary connections, we can see it broken down this way: the engaged stage, and we saw Matt in his videos in week five, and we talked about diagnostic assessment. You know, we're now here looking at these four. Here's where assessment task number two and the rest of this unit sits. We're looking at hands-on experience in the explore stage, developing scientific explanations for what we observe. And we're also going to consider current scientific explanations. These are all formative. We then move to summative, which consists of two stages. One stage is on inquiry skills. Notice that we're extending understanding to, make, to new context. Or we're making connections to additional concepts. So you take your misconception and here's where you're making connections through investigation. Now that investigation can take one of five types. We know from Loxley, one of five or six basic types of investigation. But either way, we are doing summative assessment here of science inquiry skills. How will you do this? Is it a fair test? Is it observation? Is it pattern seeking? What method are you using? And ultimately, when we look at evaluate, students re-represent their understanding. Again, summative assessment. Okay, we're looking at science understandings. So this is how the primary connections work. And at each stage, we can see conceptual change. It's really important that that comes through in assessment task number two, just as it was in assessment task number one. So the take home message, there is one conceptual idea for each stage of the five E's. And it spans the entire five E sequence. Okay. And it's emphasized and referenced often at each, each of the five E's. So each primary connection lessons, build from one to the next, contributing from one stage to the next, contributing to the key idea of a reconception or a misconception. And the teacher's actions must be consistent with the purpose of the phase to keep developing the idea. So when you're in the explore stage, you must be doing explore tasks. When you're in the elaborate stage, you're doing elaborate tasks. And SCAMP, SCAMP 2015, says every phase in 5Es is important to optimate for optimum learning. None are unnecessary and none can be or should be omitted. The impact of omitting a phase needs to be pointed out. So when we look at the five E's, the best model I can come up with is Keystone. And they all lock each other in place. Once the Keystone is removed, you know, the model will collapse. And you can go through them at different paces. You, know, you may cover something quite quickly. But the reality is you then can spend more time in a different stage of that model working that model. Investigations are critical, a big part of the, you know, the primary connections unit. So when you're looking at assessment task number two, we've got these five pillars. You know, we would expect you to see comment, comments on each of these five pillars. The types of investigations, okay, we've got exploratory investigations and they occur at the engage and explore stages. And they're characterized by hands-on things, observation, measuring, testing, representing drawing, art, constructions, models. And then we've got the fair test, survey design, and secondary data investigations. And these usually care at the elaborate stage. Now I'm doing this, you know, offering this based on an analysis of most primary connections unit. There may be one or two exceptions. But basically here we've got a couple of different types and where they occur. And they're characterized by a focus on student planning following the investigation process, representing findings, using literacies of science, drawing conclusions based on evidence and communicating findings. So we can see there that you know, we do have a very, very clear role for investigations at both the engage and explore stage and also the elaborate stage. Okay, they're embedded. They are the, the learning events that primary connections use to bring about conceptual change at those stages. Now, this is how we have to talk about the five E's in our second assessment task, conceptual change, stage-based conceptual change. Am I going too fast? This, this should be kind of revision. Um, 
it, it is kind of revision. And someone's posted on the chat, are we able to access this unit? Yes. You will see as you go down the Moodle uh, homepage, you go from weeks one through to week 12, immediately underneath week, week 12 is a library of primary connections units. They are there for you. Okay, so um, just to let uh, Alison know that, that they are there. And, and so please get in there and, and pick units early. Pick them early. So that way when we look at chemical and physical sciences, you can look at aspects of your unit and, and you can you know, focus on those for assessment. So use the remaining four or five weeks. You know, build your assessment gradually. When we look at investigating, again, we, we're talking here about you know, the, the, the third pillar in primary connections. It all begins from planning. We go conducting. We look at interpreting and representing. We then do evaluating, communicating, and then we go back to planning depending on our outcomes. And questioning and predicting come before planning. Okay, so yeah, we can look 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 at you know the the um, observation model, uh, POE, and predict, observe, explain, um, and you know again we can see pretty much the explanation's finished by the end here, over here at evaluate well probably interpreting and representing, but then we go through each of these stages, um, where we then have to look at our, our our science literacy, where we're bringing together evidence, and we're communicating our findings, compacting, collating, and, and communicating our findings to an audience and testing uh, through that audience our understanding and our conclusions. We may then be forced to do the double loop, a gyrus, and go back to the planning stage, conduct new investigations, and make new interpretations, conduct new evaluations, and re-communicate the scientific investigative paradigm. It's falsifiability, popper, everything's false till it's claimed true. And again, we talk here about students. You know, when we look at formative assessment, now let's treat them like scientists. They're making claims, 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 claims. Everything they say in formative assessment is a scientific claim. So we should be hearing it as a scientific claim and we should be challenging it because that's what we're trying to teach them. So when a student makes a representation about a science phenomenon, verbal, written, gestured or drawn, they're making a claim about what they do or don't understand at that point in time. And this sentence might have been helpful to some people, you know, three weeks ago because identifying a knowledge gap a knowledge gap is still a misconception or an alternate viewpoint. Some students say, that's just the way science is. That's how the world is. Well, that represents a knowledge gap because that doesn't explain. Okay? They need to explore why that is. They need to elaborate their understandings and they need to evaluate what this new information means about what they used to think. Conceptual change, five E's. And these claims are like gold and they provide us as teachers with, with insights into student thinking. You know, so when we get an ooh or an ah or a yuck or a gross, go with it. Hang on to it. That is gold because you know you're hitting the mark. And what you now need to do is dig for more gold, be more gross, be more ooh, be more ah, you know, inspire more awe, get them talking, make it remarkable. If they're remarking, then you're listening. If you're listening, you're picking up on misconceptions. So the purpose of investigations. Now, concluding the third pillar, we need to engage students in learning. You know, and we, we know there's different models for doing that. We've got to also introduce the skills and processes of investigating science inquiry skills, really important. And we've got to provide students with an authentic experience of science. In other words, we don't want them doing something that has no relativity, that has no meaning to them. You know, that's conceptually weird. I mean, why are we doing this? Well, I'm not going to do it. You know. Some of the literature said that, that a gap in knowledge is a preconception more than a misconception. Yes. Yeah, well, it, it's preconceived in so far as it's absent or so far as it's fixed. And it's a really good point from Sarah. Um, students don't know what they don't know. And so what we use with the diagnostics is to identify the gaps. Now, a preconception just represents a missing piece of information. Um, so so it's, a, it's a good point. Um, it's a language point as to how a teacher treats it and deals with it. But ultimately, I mean, you could also call it an alternate perception as well because, you know, the framework for understanding is missing. But, you know, indeed, it's a really good point. Thank you for sharing that on the chat. Um, this, we also help students develop an understanding of scientific evidence, the nature of science, and we're looking at conceptual development through the experience Science phenomena, that's you know, conceptual change. This is what the 5Es model is all about. So when we look at it, again, we go back to our five stages and we look at it as a learning model. You know, we're about to elicit prior knowledge. We want to provide hands-on experience of a science phenomenon. We want to develop explanations for observations and represent 
come up with representational models to develop conceptual understanding and shift it if we need to. We can make new context, we can make new connections by adding additional concepts through planned investigation. And this can be skill-based. Why did that happen? Why is that reaction the way it is? What caused that? What would happen if you did this? Students re-represent, re-represent. Okay, we began from representations. We're now going to re-represent understandings, reflect on the journey, and teachers collect evidence about achievement and outcomes. So when you're doing assessment task number two, we're looking here at assessment. How well is it doing these things? When you look at your primary connections unit, how well is it closing the circle around learner understanding? If this is a conceptual change through five phases, how well is assessment pushing this? How well is it modeling and how well is it giving students the opportunity to demonstrate understanding? Science and literacy, a big part of, you know, a big pillar in primary connections, we know that. And the early years also are a big pillar in, in, in the models there. And, and science uses particular language practices, processes and products. We've got a couple here, you know, we've talked about this in previous weeks. We look at circuit wire and, and you know, on and off switches. Now, they, these are representations, a battery, a globe. We can use all of these symbols, these symbols that theoretically don't have meaning. We give them meaning. And what's more, it becomes our language. It's how we communicate our understandings. So these students learn about and use to represent, communicate understandings. Scientific literacy is as visual, it's, it's iconic, it's, it's pictorial. Um, all of these different literacies come together in a science world. And as teachers, we should draw on them. We should be multimodal. We, you know, we can use factual text. By all means, bring out a science textbook, no problem. We can build our own data tables. We can label diagrams, symbols, graphs, models, computer-generated images, models, we can make clay models, we can use pottery, we can fire things in kilns, we can do all sorts of things for science, okay? It's just simply our way of investigating, of representing our conceptual changes. So what is scientific literacy? There's the definition from Dennis Goodrum. The use of everyday literacies to learn about science concepts and processes, the development of literacies of science, and ways that contribute to, you know, as they learn about, communicate, and represent science understanding. So we don't only expect to expose them to it. Now, this is not osmosis. It's, it's actually about use and engagement. So how well does the primary connections units that you're going to use in, in, in assessment task number two, how well do they actually embed learners in this literacy experience and framework? So it's a high priority. We go back to our definitions. Goodrum, Hackling and Rennie. Why are we doing scientific literacy? Because of these reasons. Because it makes scientists, as PRJ said, you know, 60, 70 years ago, it makes children scientists in their own worlds. And PRJ was onto something. I mean, all of his theories were based only on his three children. Okay, he didn't do elaborate observations. In fact, in assessment task number two, most of you who've done, you know, used more of a sample than PRJ did. But he used repeated measures. He went deep, he went far, and he went over time. And for that reason, his findings, you know, his models, tend to hold up. Now, the final thing I want to talk about in terms of the, the um, uh, primary connections is they've all got achievement standards. Now, when we talk about assessment, you know, we've got to talk about achievement standards. Now, we know there's five achievement standards, A through to E. And they basically mean the same thing in every primary connections unit. So this is not rocket science this part of your assessment. This is not rocket science, they're all there, okay? They're all there already for you, it already is, it's not something you have to do. But when we look at it, we can see again, you know, we've got all of these tasks that we're doing, conceptual changes, okay? All of these different levels, we're using investigation. When we look at primary connections as a learning model, we are talking about how concepts are changing, how we as the teacher are working through our assessment battery to engage and motivate students, to push them through formative interactions, to push them through some application of skills, to then get them to look at the result of using those, those you know, applications and skills and seeing what it's done to their original knowledge frameworks. You know, this is what we're doing as teachers. And again, um, when we look at primary connections, um, it does this so very well. Diagnostic assessment doesn't have to be about talking, it can be about 
drawing and mapping and conceptualizing. Formative can be about model building. Okay, we get them, okay, explain how this is. Build your first model later in the unit, build a second model. And summative, of course, can be about an actual investigation where they demonstrate competency in a particular task. You know, these are all really good things to consider when we look at types of assessment. We can be creative. And when you look at your primary connections unit, think about, okay, is it really capturing learner understands the diagnostic stage? Now, we don't have to worry too much about that in task number two. At the formative stage, you know, can the student actually come back and look at what they were doing at this stage, identify their errors, and in their final summative stage, can they build a second model to actually fix or redress or improve on their understandings? You know, to reflect the depth of the conceptual change that they've gone through. So assessment as learning. You know, and here we're talking about the diagnostics. Evidence of learning, the processes of learning, what they've learned, how they've learned, and what processes help them. So when students go through this, you know, we're really looking at trying to find out what they need help with, what they can do themselves, and where they become the more capable other. Now, often with our diagnostic tools in part you know, assessment task number one, we focused on a deficit model. We focused really on where they needed help. But diagnostic can be used for a range of purposes. We can actually build a STEAM. And once we build STEAM, we can celebrate it. We can share it. So let's not limit our understandings of teachers. Once we've done the basics, let's not go home in our lunchbox, okay? Let's, let's not pack everything up and say, okay, I worked out what's wrong with these guys. Now I'm going to fix it. Have a look at what's beautiful. And then once that's done, have a look at what's definitely beautiful. When they help other students, when they bring their learning into the social world and they communicate as, as scientists, as people, as, as young people in a world in which they have some agency and some control. Assessment for learning is something else we have to differentiate in assessment task number two. Gathering information about the gap between where the student is and where they need to be. That's really, you know, that's the definition of formative assessment. Where are you? Where do you need to be? Okay. They learn best when. These four criteria, they're given feedback. They're given advice on how to make improvements. And they're fully involved and decide what needs to be done next. A simple task here, there's a before diagram of a light globe. Here is an after diagram. Now, we can see the conceptual change. One, two, three, four linguistic cues. Four linguistic cues in this diagram. Okay, only four. Have a look at what's happened here. One, two, three, four, five. Not many more, but then have a look at the contextual cues as well. We've got measurements. We've got diameters. We've got relationships, three-dimensional relationships. We've got two-dimensional relationships, and we've got the one-dimensional explanations to go with it and the new literacies around it. Awareness here of substances. Awareness here of materials. Awareness here of so many science concepts that were not alive and operative here. Conceptual change. Okay, how do we do this through assessment? A couple more examples of assessment of learning. Here we've got our summative. We're gathering and working with evidence to enable teachers in the wider assessment community to evaluate students' progress. And again, here we've got running charts. You know, in a very public space. We talked about in the last assessment task, reporting, conferencing. Well, if you put up a running chart on a wall, um, it's reliable and accurate, it's real time, so we can see what's going on, and it's based on sound criteria negotiated with and known students. So what we're talking about here is, is judgments, learner judgments, okay? And we as teachers are able then to make parallel judgments about the extent and quality of their learning. Because let's face it, it's dynamic, it's listed, it's real time, it's focused, it's experiential, and it's investigative. And we can look at a whole range of different applications around this. You know, when we look at assessment, what, you know, what is water used for? Okay, and they can go through and, and list their final conceptions. Again, compare that after list to what might have been a before list. Okay, and we've got a really good concept of assessment for learning there. So summative assessment, you know, doesn't have to be something they do in the privacy of their own lunchbox. It can be a very, very open, very, very dynamic, and you know, a very, very shared environment. So it's constantly up there and constantly uh, alive. Questioning. 
More effort has to be spent in framing questions that are worth asking, that is, questions which explore issues that are critical to the development of understanding. And again, um, Black, so I just remember uh, applauding someone um, who was using Black in, in their assessment task number one, also talking about assessment. It's a seminal piece, assessment for learning. Um, and Black, of course, goes on to do a lot of work with Willem, and they look at assessment and some of the key criteria in that. But we can see here that, you know, questioning. And again, we can see what this leads to, comparative charts. Some of you uh, had identical tasks in, in assessment task number one, very well done. So questioning, when we look at it, there's many, many different ways. You know, we've got blooms. We don't really know to go beyond that. I tend to shorten blooms into broad, narrow, and uh, uh, fat questions, skinny questions, and wait time. And if you can work out what are, what are fat questions, um, where you're broadening, you're engaging, you're throwing out there, you've got the hook happening, you're trying to bring learners in. And narrow questions, you know, it can be direct questions, it can be one-to-one -one questions, they can be content-based or closed answers. Um, fat and skinny questioning, really good techniques. Wait time, you know, Black and Willem point out that wait time is one of the core strategies a teacher has to improve learning outcomes. If you're strategic with wait time, chances are you're gonna get more people thinking you're going to get more students prepared to react, and you're also going to get deeper and more conceptually rich answers. Um, a little task that I use there for often, often, and do encourage people to use with wait time um, is the, the icy pole activity. You know, each student has a name, an icy pole in a jar, and you simply pick up the jar, and all of a sudden they're all at attention. And you can ask a question, and you can wait 30 seconds. And they all know that there's no point putting the hand up. There's no ooing and ahhing or whistling or calling out because they know that you're in control. You're the one who's going to pick a name from the icy poles and ask that question. Wait time, a powerful tool. You know, what we call a contextual cue, mnemonic, a learning mnemonic. And questioning. When we look at the engaged stage, we've got broad questions, fat questions. Explore. Again, fat questions, discuss ideas and express common experiences. You know, we're getting down to what our common experience. At the explain stage, we're talking about focus questions that reinforce explanations of the concepts. Elaborate questions that help students understand in a new situation. What would happen if? Okay. And questions that assess students' understanding overall at the evaluation stage. So when you look at assessment task number two, right from this week, because let's face it, it starts now, and there's no point leaving it to week 10. Okay, because really, by the time you get to week 10, you can have it done. Frankly, if you follow the course and follow this format, it will do itself. But when we're looking at your units of study, you know, how well is questioning placed throughout there? How well does questioning serve formative and summative purposes for the teacher? And the essence of a curriculum unit. This week on the discussion board, um, I've suggested, okay, let's, let's give it a try. Let's do it now. Pick a curriculum unit. Get together with a, with a partner. Get together, I suggested, a group of six. And go to work on, on, on one unit. And then do another together. Why not six of you, six heads, working on one task in the discussion board where you can actually share ideas and look at a science unit, talk about you know, the fact that it could be consecutive with other units and why. Give each other something to work with. Identify the science understanding. Okay, go through the five E's and look at the following, how it develops scientific explanation. And you usually find all of these things in the appendices. Okay, it's usually listed for you there in the unit overview in the appendices. So you can browse through the unit, go straight to the appendices, and you should be able to put up on the discussion board a reasoned breakdown, a deconstruction of a you know, chemical or physical sciences unit. One that you will use and share and workshop with peers for assessment task number two. And the final thing I ask you to do for this week, if you're willing, and look, most don't, most people say I'm too busy, most people say I've got other priorities, that's okay, this is not, no judgment here, this is about opportunities. You have the opportunity to start assessment task two this week and finish it in week 10, well before it's due, and then spend some time polishing. Oh, and that's one thing too, research says that the time spent in reflective um, that the last 15% of your assignment where you're improving and polishing it, um, it is the highest uh, mark return. So it's, it's the highest value add to your assessment of all the time you'll spend on it. It's the last 15%. You'll get more marks out of that than any other time. Now, that's me finished for the week. Um, I've thrown a lot out there, um, mainly because we've been silent for two weeks um, and not had much dialogue. But the aim is to stir you up, um, to shake the tree, and to get you thinking about assessment task number two. Um, to get you looking at the chemical sciences um, content this week, um, to have you realise that if I can understand seven basic narrative terms, 
um, I'm well on my way to teaching chemical sciences. And once I've done that, I can now look at a science unit with a degree of confidence because I have a narrative around this. I can explain it. I understand where the assessment's going. I understand what con concepts are involved. And I understand why each of the E's is trying to change or develop a particular concept and in what way it's trying to do that. I'm going to pause there and ask for any questions or comments. And I welcome any. Hi, Colin, it's Kelly. Kelly, fire away. Colin, just with the assessment, when we're looking at the Primary Connections units, are they linking directly to the curriculum or are we having to link them ourselves? I, I haven't explored the Primary Connections units myself yet. Right. When you do, Kelly, you'll be deeply relieved um, and, and shocked. Um, most of them are about 100 pages long because there's so much curriculum <gasps> in there, yeah. So it's, it's not a unit outline. It is our full unit. So you can look at the oh, unit okay. and you can actually see where assessment falls. Um, and th they help you because um, they, they, they're designed for busy teachers. So there's a little, um, and probably in the first 10 pages, there's a table that, that defines all the assessment and where it is. So you can go there and look at it straight away. Yeah. Fantastic. That's great. I'll get on to that. Thank you. No problems. Any other questions or comments? All right, I'll conclude the session again by reiterating that I still have over 10% of assessment uh, for assessment task number one, 10% of assignments still haven't been submitted. That should get to below 10% over this weekend. And that means that my, myself and my teaching team will be able to release results early next week. Uh, I appreciate your patience. It's unfortunately out of our control. Some of your peers are having quite difficult times. Uh, they need our support and we just have to exercise what flexibility we, we can. Um, to give people the best opportunity to complete their work. So um, that is happening. Just to make you aware of it, we're not holding back on the marks and drawing it out for you. There are very good reasons why we're doing what we're doing, um, and it's actually going to um, foil my plans and, and my standard to get things back to you in 10 working days, which I, is something that I, I have prided myself on. So um, I do apologise in advance. Um, it is out of my control, and, and I'm actually bound by policy, on, uh, CQ policy on, on that. Thank you all for your attendance tonight. Um, I would really love to see this discussion board task take off. I'd love to see you get involved in it and really start to work it. Find yourself at least a pair or a peer or a threesome where you can actually swap ideas. You can pick the two same units because believe me, what you come up with in the end is going to reflect your teaching. You'll focus on different assessment tasks. You'll focus on different assessment recommendations and improvements than the people you know, that you're working with, your colleagues. Yeah, you'll talk about them together, but that's only going to enrich the outcome. So please do have a look at that. Um, I commit it to you. I'll just press the record button and post now, and I wish you all a good week, and please, um, let's start the discussion boards going again. Good night, everyone.